All righty. Well, it's good to have you all here tonight for a little bit of talk about bugs. Uh, my name's Daniel Sutton, and I'm with the Big Country Master Gardeners. And uh, I, as the person that was going to do this, was unable to do it, so I'm kind of a fill-in. So I'm not the best public speaker, but I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I love plants and gardening in the natural world, so I love being outside. I've got a pretty good sized garden. Been gardening since I was a kid with my dad. Um, grew up in Arizona and worked for some real good farmers there. Uh, a vegetable cotton farmer, another vegetable farmer, and a herb farmer. So I got to spray cotton and spray vegetables uh, with a tractor sprayer. Um, so I do know about mixing chemicals and getting the water pH right and whatnot for, for different applications of chemicals. Um, we got a questionnaire for you if you want to fill it out and then we can answer those questions at the end of the session. Um, I guess entomology, just something to run through, is pretty much the scientific study of insects. It's a branch of zoology. Um, pesticide can pretty much is a general term that can mean an insecticide, a miticide, um, a fungicide. Because um, that's what we're trying to combat is the issues we have in our gardens with different uh, insects, bugs, and whatnot. Which all of you, I'm sure, have been frustrated before with bugs in your garden and how to handle them and what, what to do with them. Um, we have that data sheet here. Which one should we start with? I think let's do the horticultural one first. Let me get my copy. Okay, mine's a little bit different than yours, but this is uh, horticulture IPM, and it's got a, one of those little data codes. You can pull it up on your phone. And this is a great uh, Texas website through the Texas A&M. Um, you can go on there. It has all these lists of these different pests. Um, you can look at it in different ways. You can be, I'm looking for sucking insects, or I'm looking for chewing insects, or I'm looking for worms, and they have subsections. You can pick on that subsection. It'll bring up a bunch of pictures of the insect that you might be trying to find out what it is to identify it so that you can know what kind of pesticide to use to, to, to rid it out of uh, eating all your plants up. So that's a real good, helpful site right there. Um, and that should pull up correctly. We checked it out earlier today. Um, I think most people around here probably have somewhat of the certain common bugs that everybody has, aphids, grasshoppers, uh, tomato hornworms, army worms, um, squash bugs, of course. Um, so those are what I tend to deal with and have the biggest problems with. And it'll change from year to year. One year your grasshoppers are horrible and the next year they may be minor and you got lots of cucumber beetles. So it just, I think it depends on the bug, the life cycle, the way our rains hit, how cold of a winter we have has a lot to do with it because the colder winter, usually the better spring is what I've found in the past because we get some of those killed back. When we get a lot of rain like we've had, it seems like the uh, grasshoppers breed real well. You have to think most bugs that not all bugs, but most bugs generally come, their life cycle is through the soil. So like a Japanese beetle is a larva, or um, that's not the correct term. Um, grub, there you go, thank you. A grub that's in the soil and its life cycle is part of being a Japanese beetle. And there's many beetles that are the same way with grubs in the soil. So just trying to make sure that you know, hey, this is the bug I'm looking at okay, now what is a good pesticide to use to combat that certain bug or that certain insect that you're having problems eating up your garden. Um, another thing that seems to help a lot too, 
that Don has more experience with than I do is um, soil sterilization. That that helps with. That's going to help get lessen the number of grubs in the soil. It's probably good to six to eighteen inches is what I've read. It also helps kill um, weeds. The bacteria, bad bacteria, also kills good bacteria. So you do, it is a good and bad thing, soil, soil, soil solarization. But the weeds is what I've found, it combats the best. So that's why I, I, like, I like that route, because it's almost like it sterilizes it. It gets, you want it to get to about 130 degrees, is that roughly? And you can check that with a thermometer. You want to kind of keep it moist. It gives you good information in here, how to lay it. Uh, you can put drip lines or soaker hoses underneath it. Once you go out in the morning, it, you should always see some beads of water. When you don't see those beads of water anymore, you need to water, water it again, and that keeps that cycle of heating, that superheating that soil underneath that plastic. Some people actually remove the plastic Move, uh, move the water lines over, rototill it to mix it up, to bring, mix up some, hopefully you're pulling some of those seeds back up to the top closer where it gets hotter, and then you cover it back up again. Um, it seems to do pretty good on uh, Bermuda grass also. And there's lots of different information on the web about soil solarization. So you can, you know, there's different ways people do it, different plastics they use. I know Dawn has suggested going with a six mil rather than a four. Um, so a heavier mill plastic is probably better because you can reuse it also. So once you get done in one spot, you can move over to another spot. Another reason I'm gonna do is because I, and I, it's my own fault because I didn't know and I should have, I hadn't had this problem before in the past real bad. My onion crop got a hailstorm on it, and I think that st that helped progress onion rot. So that's a bacteria that's in the soil, or can probably possibly be carried by bugs. Don't hold me to that because I know grasshoppers can transfer diseases as along with a lot of pests can. So that will hopefully combat and lower some of the bad bacteria because I can put the good bacteria back in easier than you know so i can go and go to the store get on amazon and order me some um oh i'm gonna search for the right, correct term for that um anyway they sell packets of good enzymes and good bacteria and you can just put them out when you plant and that generally seems to do a, it helps and humic and fulvic acid which a lot of people aren't really heard much about or know much about, but that's a real good way to feed the good soil bacteria and it helps uh, boost the plants. Uh, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and the plants, kind of like in a forest, how they're now finding out how trees can share nutrients through the microbial, that's the word I was looking through, microbial bacteria that's in the soil. Um, and then the one printout that you don't have is, we'll go over that one last. And I like this. I do like the trap cropping and you guys should have that one. This, yeah, this, I like this for two reasons. I thought back to myself, I said, man, why didn't I plant any hay grazer? Grasshoppers love hay grazer. I should have planted strips of hay grazer around the outside of the garden. And the benefit of that too is then if I don't want pesticides on my vegetables, at least I could spray the, the hay, whatever green crop, summer crop, mainly hay grazer, milo you could plant also. I could spray that at certain stages and, and that would trap those bugs and kill them on that before they were more invasive to the garden. One thing I want to say is everybody's different. So I'm 20 miles north of Abilene. I'm out where it's 
all open fields and luckily I don't have cotton fields around me um, but we do get planes flying for killing mesquites just north of me and and then they'll spray uh, wheat crops around me for green bugs and other stuff which that's not too too horrible I'm more worried about the the uh, um, um, it concerns me more to be worried about when they spray something that'll kill trees or kill that you may get um, overspray. Exactly, overspray. So, so what's nice about trap cropping is you, and they give you some ideas in here, what like stink bugs, and they go in to explain what vet, what crops that stink bugs will go to before they go to other things. Um, and same thing, if you just do a little bit of research on the internet, you can find out what companion planting they say works well with trap cropping and what species of bug you're actually trying to, to get away from your cucumbers um, or prevent maybe so much as not. You're always going to have issues with them, especially on a year like this when there's just more grasshoppers than you can really know what to do with, unfortunately. Um, and back to grasshoppers, there's just not a lot of chemicals I found that'll kill them. They're just, they're hard. Neem oil seems to work the best. That's what I use. Did you hear what um, Les said, what he does to get rid of his grasshoppers? What does he do? It's pretty gross. Um, he takes grasshoppers and he puts them in a blender and blends them up. Were you there? Yeah. Was it with water? Yeah, he has, uh, takes the grasshoppers, crushes them, blends them with just a little bit of water and then sprays that over his crop. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they, they won't eat the crop. I guess they're not cannibalistic. Of course, I, now you've got grasshoppers. Yeah, I've... I, I've heard they were cannibalistic, and I've heard, so I don't know about that, honestly. I've heard about people making molasses traps uh, where they'll take molasses, seven, which seven dust or what's real common. I they may take malathon. These are just some of the chemicals you can buy at Lowe's in your garden center. Um, they're not organic chemicals. Um, Carbol, which is seven dust, is a nerve agent and you take and mix that powder in with molasses, some water, and they'll usually put it in like a pie tray, and then they'll, they'll get in that. The old timers, before we had all this Bayer and Monsanto and all the different chemicals we have now, they had a grasshopper dozer, and it was a horse on each end, and they could make them 10 foot, 15 foot wide, and they'd pull it through the field, and it had a backboard like this, the grasshoppers fly up into the backboard. It's got a what they call a scaring. Actually, it's it was funny as heck to read about. It's got a board across the bottom of it, and it's it's skid mounted, so it's just riding on skids. It doesn't have tires or anything. You got to think back. This was 125 years ago or more when they came out with this, and then the, it had metal trays in the bottom. And it had paraffin wax in it. So once the grasshoppers hit stuck on that paraffin wax, he wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> then they got smarter and they figured out how to make one that was dished, dished down like this. And it had a little uh, hickey that stuck up. And the grasshoppers jump in there and it was made out of steel. They would slide down that and they'd get trapped in this box. And then they'd open this box up and harvest the grasshoppers. And usually just put them in bags and let them die in, in bags in the field. They're, I'm going to make a grasshopper catcher. I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. I bought some screen. I've looked on YouTube and seen people making them that hang off the side of a four-wheeler and they just run around in the four-wheeler and it's got this kind of like pretty deep deal made out of window screen. Just as simple as a frame and window screen. They jump in there and then usually people either drown them and then freeze them. Drown them to kill them. I guess Colin put them in a colander, get them out of the water, and then freeze them for their chickens through the winter, mainly for chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, I would imagine would eat grasshoppers. So I've been studying, looking at different things to manage them because it's just been a horrible year. 
And the bad thing about them too, where I'm at, I mean, you walk from here to the end of that table and there's gonna be 25 of them. They just, yeah, blowing up. And the other thing you have a problem with there too is your cows. So now you've got them eating grass, they're competing with your, with your cows. So that tends to be a problem with it too. So any ideas, anything you try, you see, I try and watch what's going on in the garden because I noticed rosemary, there's not very many in my rosemary bed. They don't like it. Garlic barrier, which I've got not got to spray yet this year. I should have sprayed that a month ago. They say garlic barrier they don't like. We used to spray garlic berry and fish emulsion work real well together. You can mix garlic berry and fish emulsion together and use it as the same time you're using as a preventative measure for bugs because they don't like the garlic and then you're getting the fish emulsion for the fertilizer. So you, it's nice when you're able to put two things out at once because you save, you save your, it's very st strong. Especially when you're riding on a tractor and you come home at 11 o'clock at night and your mom says, you, why do you smell like garlic and fish crap? <laughs> yeah, it's not very attractive. But that's good because the bugs don't find it attractive either. But I think sometime when you have a plague like this year where you have so many, whatever you spray to kill that area of grasshoppers, the next day there's like more moved in. So you can't. But it's different for me, and that's why I want to go back to say, okay, well, if you live over here on the south side in a nice neighborhood, the possibility the ortho man is coming to, to hit the neighbor's yard, and this neighbor's yard, you may not do ortho, you may be organic, but the, I notice there's areas where there's less bugs due to more spraying, due to, due to more, more, more chemicals being sprayed. So, and I know that on a different topic, I talked to the, a farmer up the road from me, and he's real good friends with a guy in Anson that's a honeybee guy, and he said this year because the mesquite blooms, because all the rain we got, the mesquites didn't bloom like they generally would, so he has to supplement his honeybee hives. And he was saying to me, he said, oh yeah, my biggest enemy for the honeybees out of everything in West Texas, because now his next crop will be cotton flowers, cotton honey or cotton bloom, sorry. He said is a, is a sprayer, is an airplane sprayer. So that's what he worries about the most. Um, okay, so we kind of did trap cropping to some degree, so you, at least you know what it is. It might be good for some people, it might be something some people can't use. Just dep depends on how your garden's set up, where you live. And, um, everybody's different. I've, I'm on pond water, so once we dry up, I'm, my garden is done for the year. So um, I'm slowly trying to build bigger ponds and collect more water. So that takes time. Uh, anybody that's got groundwater around here should be very thankful for it because there's very little amount of groundwater. Um, okay, back to bugs. I think the best thing you can do is always be preventative. So as soon as you start growing squash and it gets up two, three inches tall, you should start looking for squash bugs. And as soon as you start seeing signs of the eggs, you gotta act then. So if you only got maybe a five or six foot row of squash, you should nearly check it every day and you could either start to spray or you could just mechanically get rid of the squash bugs. So I've seen people go as far as to use a, a cordless vacuum and just go along there and just suck up as many as they can. And I've, it seems to work. So that's another thing I'm gonna try in the future is rigging up a cordless vacuum, probably with a little bit of a filter on the end, maybe big enough to let a squash bug go through but not malt, pick up a lot of mulch. So you might see me out there on, off, on, off, on, off, <laughs> trying to get, the, get them sucked up in the vacuum. Also on grasshoppers too, they say they sell some traps. I've seen them on the internet. They look like a, a hanging basket and you hang them. And I think, I don't know if they put a, that's one word I can't say, fen, fenom, feno, fenom? Pheromone. pheromone in them. A pheromone in them or they'll put some type of uh, something that pulls the grasshoppers into that trap. They say those work well. And they, you, can, you can Google that and find those, just type in grasshopper traps. 
it looks like you put a stake in the ground and then that trap goes over it and it's got a an way they enter and then they can't get out. And then you. I put it in the mud. Uh, the squash, I put it in the seven. They kill my plant. Yeah, sevens, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. The best. The yeah, yeah. I'm, and I had to do this. I had to. I had no choice. The squash bugs got bad, so I got my Dawn dish soap out. Well, that's just as hard on the plants, but boy, it's hard on the bugs too. So, soap spray. yeah, make a soap spray. I think the surfactant in the soap gets on them, and it it, it makes them hard for to, them to breathe, and then that's that's it. So that does help, but like at the same time, it hurts your plants. When I used to grow in a field. You were always going to have 20, 30 days between planting squash so that you could keep fresh squash for the farmer's market. So I'd get my pear burner. So they'd get bad over here in this patch, but I'd plant me another patch way over there. Well, when they got bad over here and that squash was starting to play out, I'd just burn the whole crop and burn all the squash bugs I could. Because if you didn't, once they got where they couldn't destroy that no more, there you'd see a trail of them go to the next patch. So they're, and the adults can fly. So that makes it difficult too, to combat them. If they just, um, same with blister beetles. Those can be those little, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the blister beetles. They're kind of light brownish. They got a segmented body. But when you see those, you better get your diatomaceous earth out because they travel in packs. They seem to stick together like a family. And once they get on a tomato plant, they will just de devour it. They'll devour it. So hopefully I'm using the correct term for that bug. Because it's funny how one, bu one bug might have five names depending on what people call it and where it, and they'll be, you know, actually some of those bugs will be multi-colors depending on what speed, it can be in the same, same bug but a little bit different species of that same bug. So that's why I really like this because I can go to that website and start looking at pictures and identify, which I don't know how many people use the picture this app. I hadn't tried it for bugs yet, has anybody? Okay, I don't know if it works on bugs. I'm sure there may be an app out there that you just snap up. iNaturalist probably pulls it up, yeah. That's another good app for, for finding bugs. Um, so yeah, back to watching and inspecting daily will help because you can start trying to combat it before it gets real bad. So then you have you can usually lessen the amount of chemicals you use if you if you start watching close and you try to grab a hold of the problem before it comes a real bad problem. Um, So then, you know, pretty much, I guess most people around here are going to spray pesticides first, which could include a insecticide, miticide, and then fungicides, and barrier sprays, which I would call the barrier sprays being your um, garlic spray, a hot pepper spray, and I've not used hot pepper spray a lot, but I've heard other people say that it, it works. And then I've heard some people say, well, whatever I mixed up, I, I guess the bugs thought I was putting them some salad dressing on there. <laughs> so it didn't work out real well. Um, okay, the best time of day to spray for me, what I believe and what I've been taught as a, as a kid spraying those cotton fields in Arizona was late. So right, as the, right at dusk. And I usually would spray till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning because it was that much cotton to cover. So uh, the reason that too is the life of your spray, you're trying not to get your beneficials and your beneficials are gonna be out early morning. Um, I'll see bumblebees out all day. I'll see wasps out all day. I don't kill wasps. I know a lot of people kill them because they don't wanna get stung. I don't kill them because they're a pollinator. So I try to keep as many beneficials as I can I'll actually let the grasshoppers eat up plants I don't want them eating up because I'm worried if I spray around those plants that I'll hurt my beneficiaries. So I never do that. Um, and then you need to pay attention 
always pay attention to your chemical labels. I wish I'd brought some chemical labels. Usually I rip them off the bo bottles and I put them all in one spot in a notebook in the house. Um, I usually don't leave them on the bottles. You can um, always follow those guidelines, mixing instructions and re-entry time. So if you know your tomatoes are gonna be ready in two days, it's probably better to harvest them in two days and then spray. So just kind of always pay attention to what your re-entry times is. Uh, I'll also look for chemicals or sprays that I can use that I know, okay, this will be dead by eight in the morning. It'll be, you know, it's, it's, when you spray it, it's got five hours and it's gone. So whatever bugs in that five hours will be affected, but after that I know that everything's safe. Or I'll use something I know that, that won't be, like, you know, I think Malathon and some of those, they'll be in the soil for five or six years. Some stuff you put, put out, it takes a long time for it to bi biodegrade back until it's not there anymore. Um, so that re-entry time is always important. Um, definitely using surfactants. Does everybody here know what a surfactant is? I call them, I call them a, a spreader sticker. That's what I call it. That's an easier term. A spreader sticker is always good because it helps a juviate, a juviate the spray. I can't say that word right. It helps uh, make it sticky so it'll stick to the plant. Um, some of them actually help the stuff stay mixed in the water. And there's lots of different surfactants for different applications. Um, the one I brought today is yucca extract. So that's from the yucca plant. And it's got that nice brown color and it smells a little bit like molasses. And it, it, it's sticky as heck, as you can tell. It's pretty sticky. And you just put about a half to an ounce per gallon and that'll help that spray atomize a little better sometimes and stick to the plant better so it won't run off. Because it's real important, not so much as a home gardener when you're using a pump up sprayer, but when you're spraying in a field, you have to atomize that right because a too big of a drop of water just rolls off the plant. So you kind of want to find, find mist. The same thing with the, with the sprayer like this. You, this is a nice sprayer. I've learned my lesson by buying cheap sprayers before. They don't last, they don't hold up. This was probably 50 or $60 for a Husqvarna. Um, so far I like it. I got my little bag on here somebody gave me for a Christmas gift. So I put my little sprayer nozzles in there so I don't lose them. And then I find me an old dog deal so I don't get tired. So that helps. And then this is that adjustable nozzle where you can open it up and get a, it's a circle spray. So it's always going to spray in a circle. You can open it up depending on how much, how much, if when I start out and the plants are little, it's nearly closed and it's just a small cone. When the plants get big and I need to cover that more area, I open up. And then if I want to put a fan on here and just have a single fan about that wide and go over the top, I can just change this tip out. So these changeable sprayers are nice. They give you more options to spray with. And you can change different fan types. They'll, they'll have ones that'll be uh, put out more and put out less. So you can just kind of set that up the way, way you like it, which, which works good for you. Um, and then uh, another very important thing always, no matter what kind of chemical you're using, pesticide, insecticide, fungicide, always use your PPE. So that's your personal protective equipment. Um, I start with these. I put on my rubber gloves. I got lots of grass burrs, so I use these even when I'm pulling weeds because they just protect my hands from the grass burrs. So I love, I go through about 20, 30 of these boxes a year because I'm a mechanic. So I, I don't like grease and diesel and all that on my hands, so I'm always, some days I'll go through half a box if I'm doing something that's really nasty and messy and dirty. Other thing is a respirator, especially for diatomaceous earth, because you can see how fine of a powder that is. And this, I love diatomaceous earth. 
I think that's my number one go-to chemical. If you think you have worms, you can eat this. If you want to put this in your chicken feed so the chickens don't have worms, you can put it in chicken feed. It's such a versatile deal. And a lot of times, if I'm worried about my beneficials and I know we got a good chance of it raining, I'll go out and put it out that evening, try to kill as many squash bugs, but bad bugs as I can, and I know when I wake up in the morning it's going to be dispersed and gone. Or if I'm worried about it hurting something, I'll go back with the cordless blower and I'll blow it off the plants real early in the morning before most of the bees and beneficiaries are out just to remove it, just to try to get it removed. You could always do the same thing with a garden hose and water if you wanted to wash it off the plants. If you was out there at nine o'clock in the evening trying to kill squash bugs and cucumber beetles and whatever you could throw that on, you can always use a duster too. Just stay upwind of it. So if the wind's, I'm always upwind of it and I just work my way down the garden because this will travel, on a windy day, this will travel 50 foot. You'll just have white smoke cloud in your garden. Um, this one's a piece of junk. I recommend the yellow version. It's a different manufacturer. This one came from Garden World, but you can look them up on the internet. Just the yellow one is a lot better. This tends to clog all the time on me, and the yellow one won't. So, so the dynamation pattern, does it help you with those, all those bugs? It, you need to look at the label on it, but if you, I throw it on squash bugs, and what I guess, if you look on, uh, if you look at diatomaceous earth under a microscope, it's like little sharp, tiny crystals with little sharp edges. And if it'll get in the bug's joints, it just starts eating at their joints. And that's how it works, works to, to kill the bugs. Um, I think the older the grasshoppers, it seems like they're tougher. It seems to work better when they're small and young. And the same thing with squash bugs. The older squash bugs get, the harder they seem to get to kill, for sure, without a doubt. Um, so that's, and then, like we said, PPE, that's very important. Long sleeve uh, shirt, gloves. If, you, if, any, if, you, if anything usually tends to bother, if you have asthma or, or anything, you should wear a face mask. And usually just an N95 common face mask mask will be fine. You can get the one with the canisters on the side. I've used those before. Um, so those those will protect you better, especially if you, um, some people are very sensitive to certain things in the air. So if you're more sensitive, I definitely use probably a better mask. Um, then you can go into all kinds of different stuff. This is, this is my favorite. This is, it's, Without good, it's pyrethrin. That's derived from chrysanthemums or chasta daisy? I think chrysanthemums. So this is a natural chemical de derived from flowers. Now what's so funny about this to me is in the natural form, bugs don't get an immunity to it. Once they synthesize this in a lab and you spray too much of it, they get an immunity to it. I don't understand that, but they, you can synthesize this, and boy, the stuff that's synthesized is 10 times better than this is. I'll guarantee you. I've sprayed it, and every bug out there will be dead. Everything. But that stuff's, probably now, it's probably two, $300 a gallon. This here, I think, was 100 a, a gallon. So none of, none of the chemicals, are usually no chemicals that cheap. So this is, I, I use a lot of this. Um, because if you don't, if I don't spray two to three times a week, then I don't have any produce. So it's kind of, do I want produce or do I want to spray? And then I like that this, the environmental shelf life of this is very short. So it's only good for five, six, once, once it's exposed to the sun, it disappears pretty quick. And there's probably different brand names. You can find per, natural perithrin, I believe at most garden centers and stuff, or you can find the synthroids. I think it changes names. I think it's perethroid when it becomes synthesized, and it's perethrin when it's natural. I'd, I'd have to go and look all that up. That's, those kind of things ain't really that 
super important. It, I guess it's more which way you want to be. If you want to use ortho and seven dust and mouth on, or if you want to try to use natural, natural uh, pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides. Um, this is spinosad. I, I can't even remember. I'd have to look up now what spinosad is. I believe it's, oh, I want to say it's a biological uh, insecticide. What can you use for the field mice? Field mice. I well, them, every time I go water my garden, they, shh, they run. I know I was out in my flip flops in the garden the other day and I was walking and I looked up and I'm glad I looked up and there was a rattlesnake and he was taken off. He got over in the fence row and coiled up and I got out there with a shotgun and he was gone and, and he, he had two or three, I hope he didn't have my moles in him. He better not be eating my moles because those are good. Those are an insectivore. They eat bad bugs in the soil. They eat the good ones too. But what are you going to do? You, there's never no happy, happy medium. Um, so I think with field mice, I think traps, traps might be the best thing. I know in a greenhouse, yeah, I have to keep traps in the greenhouse. My husband, he put a trap in one section. We got one like this one. The big box ones? Is it got, just, no, the one that, like the old time, the one that popped Yeah, up. yeah. He got one and he got the big one. I gave the mama. Oh, okay. The little one like that, I see it, all right. Oh my God, I hate it. Yeah, them. yeah, they're, yeah. And it seems like they're about size. Like you say, you put the big trap, you might get a wharf rat in it. And then you need the little trap and they might sometimes get set off and not get caught. But I keep like four different sizes in the greenhouse because if I don't, they eat the seeds out of the trays that you're trying to grow. I got cucumber instead of flower and they started producing. Like, and the cucumber, I saw this one under and I, Oh they're, if they're bad, sometimes they'll eat the side of a tomato out. They'll just start gnawing on a tomato and, and anything else they can find. But I think the best way to, is to trap them, is to trap them in traps. Cats. Cats. Or cats, there you go. Cats, cats. And that's a good way to keep snakes away too, is cats. In Arizona, everybody that lived in the desert had cats to keep the rattlesnakes away. So, um, this is neem. It's just a different, it's, it's the basis of Nien Asdra, well, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word because I can't say that. This is kind of a, one of them double-edged knife. Um, it's a biological insecticide. It's BT. It's what they actually forced into the cotton plant, into the corn plant, into the, so, I don't know if we got BT soybeans. But that's, uh, this works great on worms. This is all it really is targeted for is worms. Like earthworms? Or? Uh, no, like horn, tomato hornworms, army worms. Um, man, there must be 50 different types of and worms. they inject the plants with that? They bred this into cotton. Oh, bred it into Yeah, they bred this into cotton and corn. And then when the bug eats the corn, it dies. What happens when we, we eat the corn? We slowly die. Uh, there's been some studies done on this that says that it messes with your gut. And there's even studies that say glucophosphate mess with your gut. So I guess the less you can use and use it at less of a window from harvest, I think you're always doing better. So if you can keep the bugs off of it up to a week or two before you harvest, you're doing good. So... But we, sp yeah, the farmer I worked for, this is what we sprayed on sweet corn, but he was so much happier spraying this on sweet corn because he knew he wasn't using a bad, bad pesticide. So he picked one over the other. And then this one I hadn't even tried this year. I bought it and it's Deliver Biological Insecticide. It's another Bacillus uh, Thurgis type chemical like that and it's active toxins of bacteria that kill bugs pretty much. So, and then I brought a package of here's show and tell. This is inoculant for peas and any um, nitrogen affixing uh, plants. 
So you always, if you don't know if the, the bacteria is in your soil and you're going to plant black-eyed peas, purple hulls, um, any nitrogen-affixing legume, uh, mix, it's got instructions, mix this with your seed and then plant your seed. And that what it does is this bacteria puts little, well, as the plant grows, it gets these little nodules on the roots and they, put nit they take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it back into the ground. And there's actually lots of legume fixing plants. There's trees, there's shrubs, there's bushes, and they just naturally pull the nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil. But they have to have this probably bacteria for those nodules and all that to act right and function correctly. So, and then this is just a joke, but it, I used to use this. This is Pete Richards, LD340. I must mean lethal dose 340. <laughs> mountain lion urine. What is it? Mountain lion urine. Oh, cool. Now you put that around the field to keep the hogs out because they sm certain animals are going to smell that predator deer. It's like the old timers used to say, cut your hair or get cut hair and spread it around well, your garden. You know, I got cheeky and it's like, well, I don't know what animal was, but it was this long. You just saw it as it was leaving? Well, it was in my backyard. This is the weird thing. My backyard, the fence is metal, like those six foot metal yeah. or cover. But in the front area, but still that area over there is the one that's wire. You know, fence six foot, this, like a four by four. Oh yeah, four by four watt fencing yeah. wire. But he crawled over the metal. Yeah, jumped over it or crawled like over it. Yeah. Six foot. I was like. It's a. Know. It sounds like a bobcat. Well. I mean, I don't know that, I but. No, I don't see. Well, I see it far away because. Because I think bobcats can jump up to like eight foot. They can go over a high fence with no problem. He was going out of the gate. And they like. The he was like, I'm like, oh, he went directly to the front gate. They love chicken. Yeah. They do love chicken. <laughs> they do. Yeah. And then my daughter said, like three o'clock in, in, in the morning, she hear screaming. And they got, one guy said, I think it's a fox where they had the babies. Oh, okay. Good he, she said, I hear the screaming like an old, like a human being. Because foxes can jump pretty high, too. I, don't, I know they can't jump as high as a bobcat, but they can jump pretty high. Okay. Yeah. So, because I was like, we got it all fenced in. Like, about 7 o'clock, 8, we closed the coop. They all fenced it in, and I got a different area, but they all yeah. fenced it in. But I guess they go, because one time we got a, I forgot what animal was inside it. A possum or coon yes, or something? A possum. Yeah. I find it inside and we was, he was refused to get out of the inside the coop and then all the chicken was screaming and I got the light <laughs> and just, I put the water hole and it, it was water hole, I pressure, he run and by the time that he run, we get the rocks and we throw it Yeah. And the rocks and we got him down so close the coop and we leave him there and the morning they got him, they killed him. My son and my husband, they killed him. Got rid of him. With the rocks. <laughs> big yeah, rock. with rocks. Got them. Yeah, stoned them. Yeah, yeah. With a big rock. No, that's that, you, you. You have to. Sometimes you're forced to, because you otherwise you lose chickens. Oh yeah. And it's like guineas. I've been through 75 guineas. I mean, they'll start out with. They'll start out good, but as soon as they want to go on that nest, which they want to naturally do, that's when they start getting. And the worst things that have got most of the guineas is owls. And that's, I've seen a fox come out of the woods and be 12 guineas and they make such a hoop and hollering that that fox turned around and didn't want nothing of them guineas. But it's power by numbers. Yes. And the more, and then. I think they get a guineas because the guineas make a lot of noise. Yeah, they're scared of the noise. Yeah, they make a lot of noise. Yeah. Because I saw out in day and I was, it flew and take one of the jelly chicken out. Owl, owls are so weird. They'll just they'll eat the head and leave the body. Yeah. Uh -huh. They'll eat the neck and the head and leave yeah. the body. That's what they do. They and you usually know it's an owl if that's what what happens. And you usually know it's an owl if that what's that's what happens. I brought lantanas if anybody wants some. They're Texas gold. Is there any questions? I just have a question. It's gonna be kind of a silly question, but no, nothing's a silly question. <laughs> it's kind of a, for me. It's a trick question because. 
on my crepe myrtles, I'm getting mealy bugs. And I do have some aphids on other plants. And you know, you're supposed to spray them from underneath the leaves. Yeah. How do you get to spray underneath the leaves? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. The best way I found is is do do uh, and this is just water hopefully dripping out of it should be this is my or I always keep different sprayers I have one for organic one for roundup and I never intermix them some people won't if you're going to do that just get some ammonia and use ammonia and, and some water to clean between mixing but yeah I'll do a three I'll go this way I'll go over the top and then I'll come around and I'll go that way. So I'm trying to get, you know, I'm trying to get 360 around that plant. Yeah. And then I just try to stay back because I know that if the, you know, cause I don't, you don't want it in your face. Yeah. But then again, there's where you need safety glasses mm -hmm. or goggles or a face shield if you want to go that far, mm -hmm. you know. And you can get a face shield, safety glasses, goggles, all that at Lowe's. But I understand what you're saying. Aphids are on the bottom side, so if you don't spray up, you won't get them. Because yeah. that water will just run off the top of the leaves. And I hadn't tried for a long, long time. You used to go, could go buy the little beautiful Lady bugs, bugs. Ladybugs, and put them out. But they always seem to disappear quick. They won't stay. They won't stay. Okay. They won't stay. They naturally... Oh, sorry. Uh, no. It's one of the things I also suggest for aphids. Um, everybody hates wasps. Wasps love aphids. Okay. Wasps are some of the most beneficial predators you'll find in your garden. Everybody hates them because they sting, but if you let them have their nests away from areas yeah. where you are, it's okay. They'll, they'll take care of a lot of the pests in your garden without you ever having to do anything. And somebody said too, I don't remember who it was, it might have been today, it might have, is the, I think it may have been Don, the birds are going crazy hoppers. So the birds are eating up a lot of grasshoppers. I was saying the lizards, I have lots of lizards, the lizards, I saw them carrying a big old grasshopper. I was like, yay lizard, you're doing a great job. And I hadn't built a lizard hotel yet, but I'm going to. She has the coolest lizard hotel. It's the neatest lizard hotel I've ever seen. But John percent right I leave the nest alone if I usually don't bother and I'm allergic to them so I'm the last person who wants to get stung because then I got to take Benadryl and then I can't do nothing once I take Benadryl it, it makes me sleepy and can't function but they are super beneficial and then barn swallows and I let the barn swallows make nests on the porch and I put up with the poop because they're so beneficial, because I can sit on the porch and not get eaten up by mosquitoes. Done. To help you with the, the issues with the barn swallows leaving presents. Yeah. Uh, get one of those aluminum uh, pans. Yeah. Oh, like a. And fill it with you know a half inch of kitty litter, and put it right where all the droppings end up at. That's and a good idea. Take the kitty litter, dump it out, and you've got you can put it back in. That's a great so idea. That's a great idea because that's always what I found too on the farm is you don't have enough sources of green waste or manure. So you could put that right in your compost and let it biodegrade and mix in and then you'd have pretty healthy nitrogen uh, mineral mix compost. For the field mice, you said field mice, right? You could try peppermint. They don't like the smell of peppermint. You could try peppermint oil, put little drops of peppermint oil where you don't want them. That's a good idea. Every time I go to my cucumber plant, they under. And as soon as I put the water, just put it on the perimeter. And they run. Then when I go to my other plant, I got the spaghetti squash, they under there. Well, and then they kind of scare you sometimes. They make me jump back because I don't know what it is yes. until I see it. And now that I've seen a rattlesnake, I'm on high alert. Like, okay, I'm always, now I'm looking, looking, looking. And I got my snake boots out. And I ain't going out there in my flip-flops no more. <laughs> it's, it's only it's snake boots now. So, you know, they're that tall and they're usually rubberized where they can't pierce through it. But I worry about the dogs more than anything. So then I know I got hay in the hay bales in the yard, and I'm like, oh, you know, you're gonna have to get remove them and find another place to put them because that attracts mice, 
rats, and snakes. So, so it's best to keep your hay and your feed because you know if you have chicken feed, you want it to be somewhere they can't smell it because that's probably some, you know, if they smell chicken feed, mice and rats are probably drawn to it. So maybe even putting it in a good tote box or see, a sealable box uh -huh. or sealable cylinder or so some the mice, sort. If they smell the chicken poop, they don't come? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what, I know any food source mice are going to want to come. Oh, yeah. And, and like mulch, they love the mulch in the garden too, I've noticed. They come for the mulch because it's like a protection and a barrier. Do we have more questions? I just want to share a story. Since you were talking about the fox earlier. Yeah. I have it on video on our ring. Uh, just about five days ago, I live a couple blocks from here. We had a fox in our driveway. Oh, wow. Yes, I was really surprised because we live close to the creek. So I don't know, is that where, is that, do you think it would go there during the daytime? Or I, I, uh, fox, foxes are very oriented to big cities because there's a, a friend of mine did pipeline for 20 years and he's been all over the country and he says up there in Fort Worth there's an old graveyard that's kind of abandoned and he says at night foxes will come out of there and I guess they had their den up in there and this is in a, in a metro, metropolitan area so I think they're kind of I think they they move a lot you know they may have a, a four or five yeah oh and they could be yeah small dogs and cats yeah. Oh, yeah. Wherever, I guess. Before, uh, uh, Kirby Lakes. Oh. You close to Kirby Lake? Um, Kirby Lake is where you are in my house right there. Oh, okay. There. So we get all kinds. Of you have lots of nature, lots of wildlife. Yeah. They yeah. love it. That's what we fencing in everywhere. I was thinking with fencing in. Yeah. With that kind of metal thing. It was not even getting through. No. No, I agree. And people were asking me about problems with fencing, and I'm like, well, run a hot wire at the bottom. And the, the top. Yeah. And the top, yep. And I always put a bob wire at the bottom to deter digging under, but a real digging animal will go way under that wire. Mm -hmm. So that's, but you put those little clips and you stick that hot wire. Is that what you do, John? About two. You could put a uh, bob wire in the top. Yeah. So they can jump, so they jump and they can get in Well, usually what they won't actually jump, they'll climb. Uh -huh. As they're climbing up, they'll run into that hot wire. <laughs> yeah, because the, fen the fence is grounded, so they're grounded and they touch the hot. So I would think it's yeah. six foot, go do it. So I have to at least like in one foot in between and do the whole thing. Yeah, wire. I would just run a hot line, you know, somewhere about the five, between the five and six foot level. Okay. Five, six foot. So. Okay, so you just do one. You don't do one at the bottom. Okay. The only time I've They're seen... Big under the yeah. Well, the only time I've seen people do them at the bottom was for their own dogs to yeah. stay out of the chickens. You, you know. You gotta keep it clean. You have to round up it or spray it constantly. And, and you probably could get away from Roundup and go with vinegar, but that's not a cheap... That's not cheap either to spray. Vinegar for what? Oh, 10% vinegar will kill weeds. Oh, yeah? yeah. I do that. You do that? You I use that as a, so as a spray? I have to, the kids play. Yeah. I do the vinegar and soap. Vinegar and soap? It works. It works on, on everything, right? Huh? Broadleaf or grass, and, everything. And then you can spray. Kill every, the only bad thing, they come back soon. Okay, yeah. But they kill, you see brown immediately, the very next day. If so you do it in the morning with this heat, by the night, brown. Yeah. yeah. We burned a lot. Like we had, to, we had the burners that were as long as this table, uh -huh. and then you pulled a big propane tank behind the tractor, uh -huh. and we kept all the ditches clean that way, all your irrigation ditches. And you might have to burn probably every two weeks, depending on the rain and how fast weeds were growing. But you keep them clean. I mean, you, sooner or later, you burn for two years on a concrete ditch. Uh -huh. The weeds, well, we, you won't have weeds there, generally speaking. But it. Oh, okay. Well, we won't be burning. Yeah, we won't. Yeah. Yo, you got to be. You have to be much more careful out here than Arizona. But you got to think there. It's all irrigated. It's all green. You're not really going to catch nothing on fire. Yeah. But here, it's yeah, it's very dangerous, and that's an here, it's kind of a scary place because you've got.
pretty horrible front, uh, winds, straight line winds. You've got tornadoes. You've got hail. hail. It's just, it's kind of rough. It's ca a fire, because, and I'm by Shinri, so there's Shinri on one side, and then it kind of opens up, and we've had lots of Shinri fires, and we've had people lose their houses and that, so it's, it's, it's chaos. Definitely, I'm like, when the fires come, I'm like, with my binoculars, how far away is it? Do I need to get out there and start playing the fence? Oh. It makes you nervous because you don't want to see nobody lose their house, but it, it happens. It's hard to imagine that was natural at one time where it just burned up thousands and thousands of acres and off of a lightning bolt, pretty much. But well, hopefully that concludes our program. If there no, mo no more other questions? Nope. nope. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it.